Uh, my name is Leonard Alke. I'm driving machine learning engineering at Volvo Cars. Uh, essentially, we have a team of seven people that are working heavily towards effectivizing and securing the ML value stream and removing friction points along those lines. So we have had a transformer transformation journey uh, ongoing and still ahead of us, and I'll talk a little bit about that. So <coughs> first and foremost, I want to build up some type of motivation uh, for the story. So uh, I know this is very straightforward to you guys. So I guess what differs when it comes to machine learning as opposed to traditional software development, you learn the logic from data. Uh, that has some implications, obviously. It's non-deterministic. Uh, you have a lot of dependency on external data sources. It's harder to debug since the search space for a potential bug in your system is uh, uh, has more dimensions to it. So you need to go over the code, maybe the infrastructure, uh, the model, or the data itself. Same thing applies to sort of tent, uh, testing. And uh, in, in general, it's quite resource intensive, so that comes with its own complications. And then you have a lot of silent failures. Uh, I know you're probably aware of this uh, issue. I mainly added it here because I like emojis, but shit in, shit out. Um, so uh, the model itself, maybe I want to, uh, maybe it comes later. I haven't practiced the sort of order of this, but uh, basically what I want to say is what I talked about was this uh, little brain called the sort of ML model. Uh, that is just a very small component of what it entails uh, or what comprises a machine learning system. So it needs some supported functionality. And this comes from a popular paper that I guess gave rose to sort of the buzzword ML ops. So uh, in that one, it states that the machine learning model or the brain here represents 5% of the code base. Uh, so what is an ML system then? Well, in my world, I try to see it as a data-intensive distributed system. It kind of depends the level of intensity on the amount of data you use to sort of train your model and whatnot. So uh, what is that then? Well, it's software. Essentially, it's CPU cycles. You're writing software. You're writing code. Code generates the data that your model is using. It's software. You should treat it like software. So. Uh, this is also something that we've seen in uh, organizations like Volvo is that people that are trying to deliver uh, machine learning systems and value through machine learning is usually driven by people who are not uh, software developers and do not have that background. Many come from research, academia, and whatnot. Not saying that that's bad, but it's definitely needed. And I think certain aspects of uh, machine learning development, I mean, could uh, benefit a lot from just standard ways of working that software engineers have uh, taken for granted. So if you're a software engineer, this is a super boring talk because I'm just going to state the obvious. But uh, I think it's worth ranting about this to the community still, unfortunately. So I'm doing that. So here's a data scientist writing Python code. And uh, here's a guy writing a Flask application and being super proud about that. I, I was also super proud about writing my first Flask application. So I don't have a, any formal software training whatsoever. So I've gone through this uh, hell, <laughs> let's say. But uh, it's worth it. Uh, anyways, so what's the solution then? Should you just put your best software developers to work? Would that solve your problem, like in order to secure the sort of AI value stream? I guess not, because, well, basically they don't have the sort of numerical, the theoretical background. The search space for potential issues does comprise of the model and the data, so you need to be quite data savvy. In honesty, I think you can get pretty far with standard software developers at the moment, but anyways. You need to do cross-functional collaboration. There's a lot of effort involved in maintaining 
designing and implementing and driving machine learning systems in production. And it does require insights from people that are uh, very heavy into operations, infrastructure, it does require good software engineers, good data engineers, ML engineers, and data scientists. So in order to build a functional, cross-functional team, uh, you need to have some basics in place in order for you to be able to communicate and collaborate with your colleagues. What we've found and what I've seen and also from my own experience is that we suck at using Git. So <laughs> maybe we have done some snapshots to our local repo. Many have just worked in silo in like some cave on, yeah, I'm, I'm doing my machine learning here. Look at my model. But, uh, uh, sorry, yeah, yeah, sorry about that. So, but if you're working in a larger context of a team, you need to be able to collaborate on your code base and get it the solution for that. And you should basically adopt some sort of a branching strategy, which gives you an explicit path to production, well-defined. You can do parallel development without stepping on each other's toes. And it also enables CI/CD automations and all of that fancy stuff because it's basically events in your repository that leads to releases, uh, ideally automatic deployments, and these type of things. You need to have a review process. So uh, the review process entails uh, code, the model, and the analysis method, and also the data that is being used. So you just working alone, like, I mean, if you have some hypotheses or some analyses, you can actually do that type of review within a PR in the context of, uh, yeah, general basics here. So yeah, have a review process and take different angles, have somebody that has a good strength in software to review the code. Maybe another senior data scientist, ML engineer can have a look at the analysis method and whatnot. Everybody will do something wrong at some point, especially in these sort of complex setting of machine learning. Care about documentation. Uh, every PR that you provide should also contain the relevant documentational updates so that you can actually go back and people can read about what you've been doing. It's more important than you think. It's going to make stuff a lot of easy, uh, make things a lot easier. You can reuse the knowledge and the analysis in maybe a different context. You should do testing. So uh, it wasn't until recently that we started doing any type of unit testing, integration testing, and stuff like that for machine learning. And uh, I'm very proud of data scientists actually just thinking about this concept and trying to implement that within Volvo cars. What I've seen is that people don't care about this at all. So do test your code, have tests for your data, have tests for your models and for the infrastructure. As we mentioned, you know, shit in, shit out, you should make sure shit doesn't get into your system. That's kind of obvious. Uh, at Volvo cars, we should treat our machine learning systems as we treat our cars. Uh, have some sort of CI-CD implementation, automation, it effectivizes, it improves consistency, adds speed, safety, and reliability to your development cycle. Uh, I think uh, doing shadow deployments and A-B testing is highly relevant for machine learning, in particular shadows, where you can have models running with live data in parallel to the models that are being exposed to the user. That way, you have a, uh, the opportunity to observe and monitor your model before you release it. Uh, yeah, monitoring. Care about monitoring, observability. It's even more important in the context of machine learning, given that you do uh, not have full, complete insight. You should take more effort into getting uh, more observability into your ML system due to its uh, inherent sort of non-deterministic stochastic behavior, a lot of data dependencies. I think the way it's structured just motivates uh, one to care about these type of principles uh, and practices even more in the context of machine learning. Uh, you have to prepare well. What's the underlying objective? Is machine learning the right approach? This is more like 
high level business, but super important. Try to figure out the limitations from the get go. Care about metrics. So uh, try to formulate your metrics very early on in your design of your ML endeavor. Uh, so uh, I kind of wanted to add this sort of data scientist plus. So if you're a data scientist, I do believe it's good that you learn how to use Git so you can collaborate with your colleagues. It's good that you know some basics of CI CD, microservices, uh, software testing, machine learning testing, some standards in design patterns, and maybe something along the lines of having basic knowledge of distributed systems and distributed computing. Obviously, this is highly dependent on in which context you work and also at which scale you're working in. But if you're aiming at delivering uh, applied machine learning solutions, you should probably care about this. Uh, so why should you care about this? It gives you a baseline for collaboration. Technical considerations will impact your modeling decisions. You'll become more effective. Uh, you'll actually be contributing towards production. Uh, and you will not be doing ineffective handovers that I've never seen worked in practice. So here's my modeling research that I did in my notebook on this snapshot data. Try to hand that over to a software engineer to, uh, or a product team to rewrite that in C++ or Java or something like that. They will just cry themselves to sleep in the shower. So, just general decency, I think, is a good thing. So, back to the challenges. Like, machine learning, as we know, is highly experimental. The reproducibility aspects, when we talk about data, modeling, and code, is an additional challenge. The non-deterministic nature, uh, dependency on data sources that will impact your system negatively or positively. Uh, it's harder to test, it's harder to debug, and many times these fail failures are silent unless you have good observability. And uh, it's quite resource intensive. So essentially start simple, establish a way to effectively compare results early on, and have a plan for disaster because disaster will happen. And uh, yeah, I, I love this quote, so I have it in like every presentation. Yeah, don't be a stranger. Feel free to reach out. Uh, I'm happy to talk about everything machine learning related. Uh, and also, I usually have this in every slide as well. So. Uh, that's it, I guess. Was that 25 minutes? I didn't watch. Yeah, I think it was Hello. pretty fast, actually. Yeah, yeah good. good. Yeah, thank you. That was very interesting. Yeah, two non-software And uh, I feel like uh, my presentation is going to improve right now. I'm going to add emojis for sure. Great. All right. Do we have questions? No questions? Yeah, no one here. Oh, uh -huh. OK. <laughs> Uh, thank you for a really good uh, talk. Uh, I was just wondering, what are the key tools used in your MLOP stack at Volvo Cars? Well, <coughs> uh, we're a, sort of a cloud native house, so Kubernetes based, so we're focusing quite heavily on uh, adopting uh, machine learning use cases to Kubernetes. So, uh, one core uh, enabler that we are using is a fork of uh, Kubeflow which offers a centralized UI and some abstractions for data scientists and ML engineers to work with. In addition to like it providing access to some of the benefits of uh, state-of-the-art uh, cloud-native tools like Argo workflows for orchestrating and running pipelines. So you don't want to have your data scientists writing a lot of YAMLs to come to sort of communicate with the API. So it offers a Python SDK basically and then uh, we have uh, we make great use of Tekton uh, as a CI/CD engine to add all of the automation around that. Uh, yeah, uh, Grafana, Prometheus, Cloud Native Stack. Yes. Hello, Leonard. Thank you for your uh, presentation. Very nice. 
Uh, I have seen uh, your MLOps before, very nice, very neat. Uh, one question I have, in a company like Volvo, uh, you have a lot of different types of data scientists, citizen data scientists till code first data scientists. Uh, how do you, like, having such MLOps helps like centralizing everyone to have like same framework and working similarly, collaborating easily with each other. How do you sync these two different data scientists with each other, citizens and code first ones? Well, our main focus has not been citizen data scientists at the moment. So we've been working heavily on enabling applied machine learning at uh, Volvo Cars at the moment. And we have a lot of uh, work still to do in that area uh, in order for us to stay competitive as an OEM in the region. Uh, in terms of citizen data science, yeah, we, we have some thoughts around that, but in a, it's essentially uh, more abstractions, mm. simplifications, making things easier uh, in, the, in that fashion, but uh, nothing that I can sort of mention here now. Yeah, I mean, this comes to my next question. Uh, so was there a reason other than like money related that like you didn't uh, maybe buy, for example, Vertex or like SageMaker, uh, then you implemented yourself? Because I think like when it comes to those type of MLOps, then both citizen data scientists, as well as in some sort of level, code first AI uh, data scientists could work together? Yeah, well, uh, maybe. I haven't seen uh, a solution that I'm a fan of uh, as of today. I think uh, Vertex might be promising. It's basically uh, Kubeflow, but you pay more for it. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, they offer simplifications, but I think there's a lot of tools in the MLOps space in general, and I think all of them are kind of missing the point a little bit. I think many are trying to build solutions that make it easy for the user and like simplifying things. Whereas I think what we need to do as a community is try to build up some good practices. And I see many of these solutions providing easy solutions for anti-patterns, supporting sort of according to my uh, my personal opinion, the wrong ways of working. So like looking at Databricks, for example, like uh, go ahead and try to have a nice repository structure in Databricks with good CICD. I don't know, it feels like it's hacky and it's not like comfort. And we also actually tried at Volvo Cars to build, uh, m let's make it easy for data scientists to just uh, push their notebooks into production. We read this Netflix thing and we were like, oh wow, this is great. We can just push everything and automate stuff. And what you end up with is uh, an unmaintainable piece of crap. And it's like whatever tool you use, you will be wrapping around the turd. And I don't think, uh, I don't think that's the solution. We need to work on some basics first, fundamentals. Then we can effectivize that further. That's my personal opinion. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have one more over here? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> um, hi, thanks for a great talk. Um, so, I mean, a lot of the uh, not strictly related to uh, MLOps discussion you had here, I mean, you mentioned, for instance, microservices architecture and so on, seems to be kind of, I'm assuming your uh, department is mostly aimed at internal work. So what's your view on, let's say, embedded machine learning in the actual cars and so on? Because, I mean, doing MLOps in the embedded domain is quite a different beast. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, even in the embedded domain, you do have <laughs> uh, initiatives that uh, are sort of container-based, kind of like initiatives as well. So. Uh, going into that will be like more involved, but I could kind of jump back to the other question here of like not using supportive tools that, oh, let's go with SageMaker. SageMaker will never solve for this use case of doing embedded machine learning. And think of, we're caring about like 
CI CD to the vehicle where you train your models in the cloud and you can actually push your model over the air to the vehicle and doing ISO checks and stuff like that. How do you build a system that effectivizes that type of development? You will not do that with Vertex, basically, as it is right now. And uh, yeah, there are uh, additional complexities in terms of like. Uh, compression of your model and running it in the embedded area, but well, that's, we can discuss that <laughs> off, uh, offline. Thanks. Right, okay, so well, I, yeah. I see your hand. Thanks, uh, great talk, Leo. Um, Hi, Anil. What I want to know is what is your wish? Like, so you've got really good basics, what do you want next? What I want next? Yeah, what's your, like your wish? If you could click your fingers and say, now we can do this, or now we have this. Oh, thank you, Anil. That's great. <laughs> Put me on the spot there. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, just having certain basics in place, I think we've planted a seed of oval cars. I'm super proud of that. I'm seeing like a good, good sort of way onwards. The next thing I think is like organizational change, leadership sort of understanding that how do you compose these type of teams in order to make them effective and see like cross collaborations across efforts and these type of things. Uh, I would like to see that in place. I don't think the challenges that we face oppose uh, like there are certain special cases, but I don't think the challenges are technical at all. I think it's more a cultural mindset thing. So I would like to see us learning from different domains and uh, picking the best from, from all. Did that make sense? Yes, no questions? Oh, there's one. Good, we have a lot of time since you were so fast. Yeah, yeah, so fast. I can stand here forever. <laughs> Where was, oh yes, here. Hi, uh, Gabriel here. I think, uh, nice talk. It was easy to identify oneself with a lot of your points. And uh, yeah, I just have a, uh, I, I am just curious if you could mention what are your use cases? Why are you doing, why are you building MLOps? Wh what are you using this for? Well, uh, <laughs> high level, it was the first thing. So in trying to secure the ML value stream in order for us to be able to build uh, uh, maintainable machine learning systems and get value out of ML across the whole organization. That's, uh, that's basically why we're doing this. And we're trying to sort of organize ourselves, have the right talent, start working in an aligned fashion, not reinventing the wheel all over the place. Uh, I think those are the main reasons, I would say. Great. Thank you, Leonard, for this great presentation. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you.